Hello all. We are here again in this very important series of doctor talks where doctors pro, you know pro, qualified professionals physicians are here to give you the right knowledge to give you the actual information required for you to deal with this pandemic the most efficient way. So today thank you so much Dr. Ashutosh Garg for joining. Dr. Ashutosh Garg is MBBS from UCMS New Delhi and he is doing his DNB in family medicine where he is a final year resident at the BL Kapoor Hospital Pusa Road New Delhi. So Dr. Ashutosh in the last video you had you know shown our viewers a lot of important you know uh, things regarding covid you've told us about important facts about covid so today also you know we'll talk about some very basic things which every covid patient and every caregiver needs to know you know because there are as in the last video you spoke about very important things with respect to like the mask should be worn properly and then you also spoke about that there has to be there will be some differences in the readings if you don't use the pulse oximeter properly and you also you know then the other things which everybody says that a, a covid patient must have you know like a thermometer like you know uh, taking steam and then hand hygiene and you know using a sanitizer so today uh, dr ashutosh you are going to tell us all about using these things properly so may i please request you to please start with you know telling us basics about pulse oximeter and how to use it and you know how not to use it so this is one example of a pulse oximeter i hope you are able to see yes fine yes. so a pulse oximeter basically tells you broadly two things one is your pulse rate and the second thing which we are most concerned with as of now is the saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen meaning the oxygen content in your blood that is a crude way of saying it because i don't want to go into uh, details but the oxygen content in your blood that is what is called as spo2 so in patients of covid because their lungs are not working properly even if you take in oxygen it's not going into your blood so this is a measure of how much oxygen is going in other words how bad your lungs are working usually we maintain a saturation of above 94% it can be as high as 100% but there is no fixed value you may have 99% i may have 97% it does not mean that mine is lower than yours it is perfectly all right my 97 is fine your 99 is fine we are not different i may have 99 after 2 minutes i may have 96 after 2 minutes again no difference when you get covid and if your lungs dysfunction your saturation will decrease if it is continuously decreasing if it is going below 94 and it is remaining there meaning sometimes simply because of technical error you might get a reading of 92% even if you are all right you see it again you might get 97 so again the idea is persistently what is your reading not just once that's very very important people get panicky if they see a 92% reading so if you have a consistent reading before below 94 you should be concerned if you have other symptoms of covid along with a percentage below 94 you should be concerned now how to use it the basic idea is you fix it on your finger any finger even on your toes you can put it on your ear lobe it doesn't matter where you put it these places are fine the only thing that you need to be concerned with is try not to have nail polish on because certain pigments they don't allow light to pass through so you may not get a reading or you may get a wrong reading so although evidence says that nail polish if if you, if you are getting a nail if you are getting a reading through the nail polish it is not so bad but if you are getting if you are getting no reading or if you are getting very low reading and you you have no symptoms it is better to remove that nail polish and only then take a reading now if you have a low reading at home and you may not have any other symptoms it can be confusing it can be panicking so it, at that point of time i would i would advise please contact your doctor and tell them about your history tell them about your symptoms tell them about other disease that you have and then let take let them let them take that decision rather than you panicking so just because you landed up with a saturation of 92% please don't rush to the hospital 
Okay. So that is the basics about pulse oximetry. So, so you know, like any pulse oximeter is good, or you know, to you to look at certain things, certain specifications in a pulse oximeter. You go to a market, and you know, he gives you a pulse oximeter A and B. What? How do you differentiate which one is better, which one is good, which one is more sound? So, what is this uh, whole thing about? Um, as far as I am concerned, it would be very difficult for me to tell which one is better. Okay. I do trust some companies. Yeah. and uh, they are dr trust dr morpen uh, bpl omron and accusure so these are some of the companies which i would advise you can take other companies i'm not so sure of so you need to do your own research i i don't know about other companies so much absolutely absolutely and you know uh, with respect to pulse oximetry and this whole thing so you know is this pulse ox oximeter that we have you know the small little thing is it as good as the, you know the uh, spo2 meters which are there on the meters in the hospital are these two comparable those meters are more sophisticated they use uh, uh, more wavelengths but then the wavelength that we are concerned with is also measured by this so okay. there is not much difference so there's not much difference it's as good as that that one so you know you can it just add as good as it is as, okay it as good as that okay. it depends upon the company it doesn't depend there's no difference between this oximeter and the oximeter say in an hospital but it depends upon the company so if the company is making a bad one i you can't tell can you just put it and show it show us show the viewers once as to sure, how the sure. readings have sure, to be sure. read so sure. yeah sure so you fix it you rest for around 1 minute sit down i mean you can even stand doesn't matter but just rest for some time so if you can a little so, little uh, yeah, yeah 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 yes 98101 yes 98101 100 yeah. yeah yeah so my pulse rate is 9 uh, 100, 100 and spo2 is 98 so so you know we we heard that it has to be at the chest level it has to be at the table level is there something around that it has to be at a certain no, level there's, there's, in there's the last nothing. video you were telling us that if you move your hand the reading is going to change yeah if you shake if you shake it if you vibrate it too much that is the problem because this might not be fixed okay that's all you don't need to keep it at heart level and is there any difference if you take it in the dark or in the light or in the sunshine no, no there there is no difference there is no difference okay. so take it anywhere it's fine yeah it's fine it's fine okay 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 thank you thank you so you know this was a little bit about pulse oximeter and you know we've also spoken a lot about the last video so this is a link right there in this video of the last video which was given by Dr. Ashutosh. So you please have a look at that last video also. It was a very informative, verified, professional uh, video by a doctor. The doctor is sitting right here in front of us. And you know, next, very important, you know, uh, for COVID patients, the uh, temperature has to be, you know, constantly monitored. You know, even in the latest guidelines, which uh, you must be very aware of, by the Ministry of Health and Family and Welfare, and even the previous guidelines and all the guidelines possible, they speak about maintaining the fever. They speak about monitoring the fever. And you know, the basic tool that we use to monitor fever is a thermometer. So can you please sh tell us, show us the thermometer, tell us how to use it. Now, this may be very basic. We all know thermometers, yeah. but can you again tell us how to use it properly? Fine. So we have two kinds of thermometers in the market. One of them is the mercury thermometer and the other is a digital thermometer, uh, which are basically used in medicine. So this one is a digital thermometer. All right. Yes. We usually discourage mercury th thermometers now because uh, you may break it. Mercury may get into your system. We don't want that to happen. And digital thermometers are as good as mercury thermometers as long as you're using a battery that is working. Now, Having said that, you can use digital thermometers at home. They usually they show readings in two formats, either Fahrenheit or Celsius. In our country, although we use the SI system, we use Celsius. But uh, I've seen generally Fahrenheit being preferred nowadays. People tend to remember 99 rather than 37 now. So one thing that I would like to tell is, number one, how to use it. Basically, it is important that you shouldn't have taken a hot liquid or a cool liquid prior to measuring your temperature. That's the only thing that I would say is most important. There are two places where you can check your temperature. One is your axilla and you take it inside, not, not against your cloth, but in your axilla. And the other is under your tongue. 
so you have to close your you have to close your mouth fine the, the best reading the reading that is considered by default is the oral temperature not the axillary temperature meaning if i'm just saying temperature by default as a doctor i mean oral temperature because the axillary temperature can be around 0.5 degree fahrenheit lower than the oral temperature so of course that calibration can be taken in mind but often we don't mention so what is uh, when it is not mentioned we're talking about oral temperature so you have not taken any hot liquid you have not taken any cold liquid you've inserted it under your tongue wait for some time usually digital thermometers will uh, have a noise coming out so once that noise comes out it comes out after around 1 minute when the temperature stabilizes and that is your reading so that is how you take your temperature now coming on to the reading it is very important that when you quote your temperature quote the entire reading don't just say 99 say 99.5 99.7 99.8 whatever it is but always quote the entire reading quote the decimal point why the definition of fever is that in the morning you have a temperature of more than 99.6 degree fahrenheit that am temperature morning is more than 99.6 degree fahrenheit and in the evening it is more than 99.9 degree fahrenheit what that means is in a normal person who doesn't have fever your temperature is to likely to be lesser in the morning and higher in the evening now if this person has fever then the likelihood is that in the morning the temperature will be lesser as compared to night so 99.6 in the morning 99.9 in the at night now coming on to monitoring broadly speaking there are two kinds of people one of them who are old and uh, may have diseases like diabetes and maybe on steroids these people are often not able to tell that they have fever these people are often not able to say that i am feeling warm or i am feeling cold so in these patients it may be very difficult you may have an 80 year old man saying that i am just feeling weak i'm just fe- i don't feel like eating i just feel like sleeping you go to him and you touch him and uh, you measure his temperature it may come out to be 102 he may not even complain of fever versus a young person who's very unlikely to say that i am not feeling warm or not feeling cold if he or she has fever having said that so we have divided people into two categories the old with diabetes and the rest of them the young people i would advise that in young people there is no need of monitoring temperature just like that if you have a complaint yes definitely uh look take uh, take your temperature but in older people if they are complaining of even vague symptoms yes measure temperature take their blood pressure take their pulse rate measure their respiratory rate take their spo2 in these people definitely make all measurements but in younger people there is no need to panic and how many times a day do we measure and we monitor and we write down these readings okay there is no consensus uh as far as this is concerned but four times a day seems to be a good uh, number of readings okay four times a day for and especially for the elderly patients who you know are at a higher risk and you know even if they have the basic of the symptoms the most biggest of the symptoms their monitoring is most important as doctor you just yes. told us all so you know now uh, this is a little off question but you know please try to answer this now there is this thing that you know antipyretics or these uh, paracetamol dolo whatever name you call them uh, you know with they should not be taken if the fever is not crossed 101 is that true because you know there is this idea about that that virus uh, or any external element into the body fever is a natural mechanism to curve it so should we take antipyretics or paracetamol if we have not crossed 101 or you know like should it be only taken when we are like 104 or very high fever high grade fever? no 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 as far as professional advice is concerned there is no such recommendation that you shouldn't that you should avoid taking antipyretics uh, fever causes dehydration because you will lose more water uh, you want to prevent that it when you lose water you are disturbing the electrolyte balance in your body you don't want that to happen when you have fever you feel ill you don't feel like eating you don't feel like working you don't feel like moving on so that is just a chain of ill effects that we are taking uh, giving birth to if you have fever you are feeling feverish and uh, the temperature is high 
take paracetamol, no problem. So when you say temperature is high, what is a high temperature? In the morning, more than 99.6 degree Fahrenheit, along with the fact that you're feeling feverish, which can be warmth or cold, and at night, more than 99.9. And you know, like in the, in the guidelines, there was like, if you do not have fever for three continuous days and you have no symptoms, then you can consider yourself as, you know, free from COVID. So what is this three-day uh, idea? Do you, is it some, some scientific thing or just a random uh, three-day figure that they came across? What, what, what was it exactly? I mean... So it's like I, if you, if you, if you uh, do not have fever for three days and you don't have symptoms, then you can co consider yourself out of home isolation if you are a COVID patient. Uh, that is a general advice for any uh, disease for that matter. Usually if, we, if you are admitting a patient and uh, you have done all kinds of tests, you're keeping the patient, the patient is stable, but the patient is having fever. So we don't know what is going to happen next. So usually hospital advice says that you keep the patient for at least 24 to 48 hours, see if they have no symptoms and only then let them go. So the same is with COVID, nothing special about COVID. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. You know, next uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, before talking about the mask, which we have to talk about importantly, talk about taking steam. So, you know, I have right with, it, with me, the steam uh, equipment that is very easily available in the market and you know this is this, this is like this is the plug for this this is put into the ball socket and this is filled with water up to a certain level and over here you have to put attachment so this is the common attachment that is easily available you know and this is put like this and there's also another uh, attachment available this is that bowel attachment you know which actually fits your uh, your face and you can take the steam like this so uh, how do you use this doctor like you learn a lot of things about take the steam in from the nose take it out from the mouth take it from the mouth take it from the nose what please you know take this uh, demystify all, all this for us yeah fine so we'll be talking about two things number one when you should use it number two how to use it fine so when when do you use it first the basic idea is this when you have debris or phlegm inside your throat or in your nose, your body through uh, brushes called cilia in your windpipe are trying to throw them out. If you have phlegm in your nose over here, your cilia will try to take them at the back of your throat. If you have that phlegm over here, they will again try to push it upwards. So basically they will try to bring it over here and out. You throw them out by coughing or voluntarily. So the basic idea is that you want to throw them out. Now, what we have seen through various studies is that in order for this mechanism to function, you need the air inside to be moisturized. If the air inside is not moisturized, these cilia, these brushing mechanism doesn't work. So that's the bottom line physiology behind using steam. We are not using steam for the warmth of it. We are using for the moisture. Okay. So that's, that's very important. We are not using for the warmth of it. It okay. is just that you need to heat up water for, to take it inside. You can't take ice inside. Absolutely. So the idea is moisture. Number moisture. one. Okay. Number two, when do you take it? You take it when you're not able to take out your secretions. Okay. As simple as that. Okay. You are coughing. You are exhausted. There's lots of phlegm. You're feeling congested. You're not able to take out. You take steam. How much do you take? There's no consensus again. It is again based on how much is the requirement. You take it four times a day, you take it six times a day, you take it once a day. It doesn't matter. It depends on how much you need. So that is, we've talked about when you need it. Fine. Now, how do you use it? In the market, you'll find broadly speaking, two kinds of uh, devices. One is which with a bowl that Raja just showed. And the other one is with a nozzle or with a, yeah with a nozzle that sends out a narrow stream, right? So this one is the nozzle, which, which will send out a uh, narrow stream. Now you have to understand something. When you are putting in steam, there is a likelihood that you may injure your cells also because you're giving, giving them heat. That is why when you have common cold, when you have viral illnesses, cough and cold, you should neither take cold to cold stuff nor you should take too hot stuff because you will yourself injure your uh, pharynx, your mucosa over there. The same goes with steam. Try to take steam in a broader bowl and don't overheat. 
So the idea is let the surface area be huge. Let only some steam go in. And that's all. Do not use a muzzle as far as possible because you will not be able to regulate the heat energy that the steam is bringing in. So it is better to use it at low concentration because again, we are only concerned with moisture. We are not concerned with the warmth. Okay. So, so our concern is the moisture and moisture can only be in a gas form if it is heated because water cannot reach our internal or you know the internal parts of our nasal cavity and our you know uh, this part in water form or in ice form so the only third form is the gas form which is water vapor form and water vapor is only there when you heat the water and it becomes heated vapor so that is the logic which doctor has very clearly told us all so you know we have to take care that we should never use this one we should always use this attachment so that the increased surface area is there because steam can otherwise injure your internal cells. So thank you, Dr. Ashutosh, for telling us that very important piece of information and demystifying it. So, you know, this whole concept about take it from the nose or take it from the mouth. Is it of any value? Take it from all the pores, from your nose, from your mouth, because again, the idea is that you want the cilia to function and throw it out. So Absolutely. you just take it from everywhere. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, the most important thing that you know in the last video the link is right there in the last video you told us about the mask now the mask the holy grail of prevention of covid <laughs> please tell us how yeah. to use it properly all right so uh, this is a big topic in itself but i'll try to keep it short we have all kinds of masks in the market this is an example of an n95 mask i hope you can see yes right? absolutely clearly Fine. So this is an N95 mask. N95 mask meaning that up till a certain size, it will prevent 95% of those particles from entering in. That means 5% can still enter. All right. Number one. Number two, apart from this mask, you have the one which is the basically the pollution mask, which has a filter on it. The a filter valve. is a, a valve. Uh, is there. Yeah, a, a valve. Yeah, a valve. So the valve allows the air to go outside but it doesn't allow it to come inside. Meaning, if I have COVID and I'm going in a bus, then I will be spreading it by using that kind of mask. So again, that mask is totally discouraged. I have seen it in the initial days, many people were using it, but I guess that information has already gotten out not to use this mask. And then you have the cloth masks, you have the surgical masks and all sorts of material being used to make masks. The greatest um, benefit is by N95 mask for general public and for doctors. But usually what is happening is uh, because of availability in order to ration it to healthcare, the people are expected to not use N95 right now so that we can keep it for hospitals. So in these patients, you can use cloth masks, you can use surgical masks, you can double up those masks. So that's the idea about the various types of masks. Now, how to use this, that mask? Ideally speaking, after uh, before you wear your mask, you should have cleaned your hands. Your, with soap and water, you should have cleaned your hands. If your hands are not visibly soiled, then just uh, spirit. Spirit will do. What we call as the chlorexidine spirit. To be precise, the chlorexidine spirit. The pink wala hospital mein milta hai, that one. Um, so you take the mask. You've cleaned your hands, fine. And you wear it. Now the idea is that it should be clipped on your face and most importantly, clipped over here. You clip it as much as you can. If you think that air is still coming out, if you can feel it, or if you wear specs, you will feel foam uh, forming in. So you put a tape over it here like this you can put a micro pore tape it's a white tape you'll often find in hospitals doctor tape it is called yeah yeah we call it micro pore so if you go to a chemist i think they'll understand micro pore and um, so that's it that's the main thing about mask and you know, using, else you using surgical know? mask or using double mask using triple mask the moh the ministry of health and family welfare told us that it is a 
three layer mask you have to use so is it beneficial to have a three layer mask you know because See, we have yeah yeah because you know you we have us, to take in you told us about you know people who are having beard or you know who are having you know so they have to have multiple layers of mask before wearing the n95 on top so please tell yes, us yes 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 uh for them i was uh, i what i meant was that uh, they may not be able to use the n95 mask because they may not be able to, be able to uh, seal it properly so in those people uh, for example in uh, in your case also it would be better to wear a cloth mask because that will fit properly this may not fit properly uh but again n95 is something that has to be saved right now we may sh run short of it in due time we did run short of it in uh, 2020 so other masks are useful as the uh, population gets vaccinated the usage of mask will decrease in fact today just today cdc issued a guideline that uh, in us if uh, you have been vaccinated you don't need to wear mask that's a big guideline so so when you say vaccinated that means after your second dose 14 days you have completed then you are considered fully vaccinated am i right doctor Yes, yes. After your second dose. So after your second dose, you have to wait for certain days, and then you consider yourself vaccinated. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Absolutely. Both doses. So, so uh, you know, uh, you've spoken about this uh, mask, you know, which is you know also expensive, you know. So you know, people use cloth masks, and different situations are there. So you know, mask everybody has to use, which you have made very clear. So you know, next we are going to talk about something very important, that is hand hygiene and use of sanitizer. So can you tell us about how important it is and how, what is the correct way of doing hand sanitize hygiene and sanitization and using a sanitizer? Uh, fine. So broadly speaking, we have two ways to sanitize our hands. One is the sanitizer, and the other is soap and water. Uh, thumb the rule of thumb is if your hands are visibly soiled or you are going to eat food, you use soap and water. Fine. On the other hand. in a hospital setting or if you are going outside you are traveling and your hands are not visibly soiled it's a good idea to use a sanitizer now about sanitizer there are several kinds of sanitizers all of them have the basic simple composition but i have found that many people are selling diluted sanitizers so one way to know whether it is diluted or not is when you apply it a good sanitizer will evaporate very quickly in seconds it will evaporate but if it is diluted you you will still feel your hand is wet so try not to buy that hand sanitizer okay secondly there is no need to put sanitizers all over your body because the again cdc fda both of them have told both of them have come come up with their latest guidelines that surfaces do not spread viruses to that much extent the main uh, way of spreading is through respiratory droplets that is all you do not have to be a fanatic when it comes to cleaning your surfaces please don't do that you are actually harming yourself absolutely 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 great great uh, so you know uh, thank you for answering you know all these questions about hand hygiene sanitizer there is a question from a user so the question from a viewer is regarding you know uh, regarding the mask reuse of mask so can this n95 be reused again and again or it has to be used alternatively or it has to be thrown after one use can you tell us about this whether it is a disposable thing I, or can be reused yes ideally if i am going to the hospital i should not be using it again that's for sure but again the cdc guideline if we take that into consideration that it's not spreading through fomites so we can use it number one number two uh, again it is about efficiency we cannot be wasting so much so i the, the mask that i am getting for example in my hospital i get five masks in a month so i i have to use one mask for at least 5 to 6 days so that rationing has to happen in a country like ours and it is not wrong it is okay but don't exchange don't, don't use other people's mask so you know as we come to the end of this interview there is an important question so in the ministry of health and family welfare guidelines and you know if we look at the newspaper goa if you look at uttarakhand if you look at so many states they have all suddenly started to you know prescribe officially through the state machinery you know preventive medicines prophylax prophylaxis like hydroxychloroquine like avermectin so sir doctor what do you say what do you say about the use of preventive medicine what do you tell us about prophylaxis and their use 
Okay, I'll try to discuss all the preventive medications that we are discussing in public or any of the forums, whether it's WhatsApp or ministry guidelines. Uh, let's start with hydroxychloroquine itself. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug that has we've been using for malaria for a long time. We used it before, and now and then we started using it for diseases that are called as auto-inflammatory diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, and other diseases also. And then it was found that it seems to be working against COVID. Now. That is all that was mentioned at that time. If you go deep into it, the study was an in vitro study. It was not done on human beings. It was not even done on animals. It was done on cell cultures. You took cells and put them in a petri dish. You put that medication. You saw what are the biochemical changes. And they saw that it does something. I will not go into the detail of it. It works on certain receptors. And that is how they saw that it may work. So no study was done when it comes to human beings. So that is the main major drawback. Secondly, some studies were done, but they were not randomized. They were not controlled trials. Given all that, none of these studies have so far said that it works. None of these studies. Our ministry guidelines, if we go by it, I'm not sure what are they basing on? What is the evidence that they're basing on? What is the references that they're taking? But if I take into consideration international studies, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States says that we cannot advise it and we cannot say don't give it. That is what they say when it comes to hydroxychloroquine. Now the problem is we, we haven't seen any good effect. So it, bought, uh, it boils down to what experienced clinicians will do. Clinicians who are past the age of 50, who have seen uh, many cases, who have seen bird flu earlier, swine flu earlier, what, what do they want to do? So the evidence says don't use HCQS. Again, the ministry is probably using the idea that it's not harmful. There is no evidence against it. So let's use it. There is in vitro activity. So let's use it. Other than that, I don't see any rational behind it. Okay. okay. When it comes to ivermectin, Everything that I said about hydroxychloroquine applies to ivermectin as well. There was a Bangladesh uh, study done in Bangladesh with 72 people, uh, but it was not a randomized study. It did not show effect on human beings, although it showed in vitro activity. Then a retrospective study was done in Bangladesh itself with around 250 people. That did show some activity, but it was not a randomized study. It was a retrospective study, but it was not a randomized study. So again, what was the effect of other factors in play? We don't know. So again, hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, we cannot say. One statement that was made about ivermectin was that you need to give 100 fold the medication that you otherwise give in order to have some effect. That is, you, you might be damaging a, a person's liver if you're giving such a high dose. And at, the, at what cost? There is no benefit shown. So when I don't have good evidence before me, when we are in a Play, uh, when, when we are in a situation wherein things are changing every day, new evidence is coming every day, I would go by uh, an experienced clinician who, whom I trust. And the people whom I trust do not trust these medication. So I don't trust these medication. Okay. 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 So, so, uh, so, you know, because of this uncertainty and, you know, because uh, as you have said that there is no confirmed evidence, and, you know, there may also be, you know, side effects, which you have, uh, I think, mentioned. Are there side effects of these two drugs also? De definitely. Hydroxychloroquine affects your heart. Ivermectin yeah. in very high dosages affects your liver and your kidney. Yeah. So when there is no benefit, when the virus in 80% of the people is going to be mild, then in those patients, there is no point of experimenting. Okay. okay. So, so then the, there's a third medication. There are two more medications. One of them is Limsi, I'm sure you know of. Yeah. which is basically vitamin, vitamin C yeah. and uh, Zincovit, which is basically uh, zinc. Yeah. Again, uh, FDA says that they have no evidence supporting their use. Earlier on, in 20 uh, 15 years back, uh, for common cold, there was a guideline that we can use vitamin C in high dosages. That two of two grams, LIMC comes in 500 milligrams. Usually by clinicians, it is being prescribed at a dosage of right now, 500 milligrams twice a day. So that's one gram. The effect was seen at two gram. We are giving, we're not giving two gram to anyone, and that too not much. We have better medications to reduce your symptoms to make you feel better. 
so again lim c is not curing covid 19 zinc is not curing covid 19 it is not even preventing covid 19 it's not even a prophylaxis forget about treatment it's not even prophylaxis okay okay so so the so the idea is that 80% of all the people who get covid are going to get cured by themselves if they just you know keep their fever in control and they have good diet and they take good fluids and you know take all the good measures of taking rest and all so there's no need for such medicines so uh, you know that is actually a very big eye opener for many of us so you know you know we have covered a lot of ground today we have discussed a lot about you know instructional guidelines of how to use pulse oximeter thermometer mask steam and you know sanitizer and hand hygiene and we've talked spoken very important topic that is the use of prophylaxis you know especially the ivermectin hydroxychloroquine and you also mentioned about zinc and lim c so that is shedding a lot of light to this very important you know uh, medicines and the procedures and the you know instruction for the use of equipment which is required for by everybody who's in home isolation so you know we really really thank you dr ashish uh, one more thing i would like to include i just forgot about it there's something called the 6 6 minute walk test okay so people who are old people who have other morbidities like diabetes liver like i mentioned old people often don't are not able to tell that they have symptoms yeah. they may complain very uh, vague symptoms and uh, sometimes even for younger people what you can do is if you have symptoms if you are a covid patient and you are at home you take a pulse oximeter fix it on your finger see the reading what is the reading right now when you are sitting and walk around for 6 minutes time yourself walk around for 6 minutes at the end of 6 minutes check what is your spo2 if it has fallen by 3% number 1 or it is falling below 94% then it's it's a good idea to contact your doctor okay okay so so 6 minute walk test at home test that you can do to figure out whether you know there is a sudden drop you know it's not a foolproof test i just want to please warn people it's not a foolproof test so okay. uh, the 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 idea is you contact your doctor if Absolutely. you get such a reading but you know people who are at home and you know if they want to just have some idea i think this test can be used by people because you know uh, you know instead of you know having no idea this test will give them some idea and then they can talk to a doctor and tell them that okay this is the first sign and then doctor can tell them more tests or you know more examinations and you know make a conclusive judgment which the doctor you know is qualified to do so you know thank you we have done a lot covered a lot of ground today it was very useful for everybody who is dealing with covid 19 and you know especially in your in home isolation so i really really thank you doctor you know that you are so busy and you know out of your important uh, you know 24 24 hour shift in covid wards you know after all that you have taken time out to educate and you know to you know make the people aware about the right uh, use of medicine and equipment so that they can take care of themselves in a better way so thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you